Hey everyone, well, here we are, AMD Radeon RX Vega. We've been waiting literally years for it, and right here, right now, I have the entry-level product and the absolute top-tier performer, Vega 56 and the liquid-cooled 64. The rumors are finally dispelled. NVIDIA's GTX 1080 Ti and Titan XP still sitting pretty at the top of the tree with no real competition. Vega does something different though, it takes the fight to GTX 1070 and GTX 1080 instead, which is fine of course, but it doesn't fundamentally do much for the GPU arms race. Now I'm pretty confident in saying that Nvidia's next gen Volta range is ready to go. The question is, do they really need to release it now that Pascal has been proven to still be king of the hill? Now Vega 56 here, yeah, assuming it can keep to its price points, it's actually a really good product if you're in the market for GTX 1070 class performance. Vega 64, I'm not convinced it's that compelling against GTX 1080, and to be frank, I'd expect more from a Halo product like this, particularly with that sort of massive thermal solution strapped to it. Fundamentally, the very best that AMD has to offer is only ballpark competitive with what is now Nvidia's second tier product. When you look back at the Vega hype train, you can see why AMD has kind of worked over the last few months to sort of dial back expectations. Now, I'm going to be looking at Vega 64 in more depth in a later video, hopefully once I've got hold of the air-cooled version, but the real star of the Vega lineup is easily the 56 here. Now, let's take a look at the specs to see exactly what the differences are across the range. We've got the stats for all three of the current Vegas here. And you'll note that with the 56, AMD has taken a significant chunk out of the HBM2 memory bandwidth, reduced clocks and paired back compute units from 64 to 56, hence the name. But you know what? I'm kind of reminded of the CPU comparison between the base Ryzen 5 1600 and the top tier 7 overclocked to 4 GHz now on paper. There's a big spec differential, but real life performance? well, you don't actually lose that much, making the cheaper product even more desirable, especially when overclocking options are available. Now, to begin with, you'll only be able to buy this version of the 56, the reference model. It's got a full metal body, a backplate, vapor chamber, heat sink. For the 56, it does a pretty good job, though things start to get seriously loud if you choose to overclock. However, in terms of outputs, we're still looking at AMD's standard 3 display ports and HDMI 2.0 here, and I'm still not particularly keen on the decision to bin off Dual Link DVI. Now, this card is pretty great for 1440p displays, and there are a ton of them still out there using the DVI interface. The only other aspect worthy of note concerns the power inputs. There are two 8-pin sockets here, which may have an implication on the kind of power supply you're going to need to run it. And yeah, it kind of hints that this is a power-hungry card. Compare and contrast to the reference GTX 1070. Just one input required to get the job done there, and compatibility is therefore much easier with a wider range of power supplies, which is all well and good, but it's all about performance, right? Well, here, the picture is looking very nice indeed. Let's start off with the bad news. I mean, not every product is perfect, right? Well, there are some bugs, oddities, and flat-out poor performance to consider. Let's kick off with Assassin's Creed Unity. It's a game that was designed with what you might call a highly optimistic view on what the power of the Xbox One and the PlayStation 4 would actually be. Bad news for the consoles, great news for PC, where the game is still simply beautiful. Three years on, this title is still a brutal test of GPU power, but there's something odd with Vega here. Whenever Ubisoft uses depth of field, performance falls through the floor. Now, you can see this in effect on Fury X, where it's not great, but you can actually see that it's worse on Vega, where that effect is deployed, though. I mean, overall, though, in a greater scheme of things, I mean, it's not a massively popular game. Nobody's really playing it, so no worries, right? Crisis 3, though, the Vega 56 offers performance that's pretty much on par with the old Fury X, despite the newer architecture and much higher clocks. Yes, it has lost 8 compute units against the older card, but generally I found that the Vega 56 is about 17% faster than Fury X overall, and that's significant. Not here, though, the lack of a bump in frame rates is puzzling, and I wonder why. 
Are Vega features simply not implemented for this title in the driver? Would this affect other legacy games as well? And then there's Grand Theft Auto V. I mean, unlike AC Unity, there's no doubt people are still playing this game. Lots of people. In fact, it's one of the most popular games on the format. Some of the reviews we've seen have had the GTX 1070 beating even the top-end liquid called Vega. But our results show the Nvidia card only really pulling ahead in detail-rich city scenes. Topped out, GTA 5 uses a lot of CPU resources, and we suspect it's simply a more optimal Nvidia DX11 driver in effect here. Now, this one is a bit of a mystery. Again, we'd expect better from Vega here because so many of the other results are so much more competitive against Nvidia. Okay, well, that is all of the bad news out of the way pretty much, and it's only good stuff from here on out as we crack on. I'm going to concentrate on 1440p performance for the most part here as this really is the sweet spot for this kind of hardware. Of course, you can run this card at 1080p and get some good results, but fundamentally, the variation in performance is really significant. You will hit CPU limits, and yes, you're spending a lot of money on a GPU where you're effectively leaving a lot of the performance on the table at this lower resolution. It's best summed up by this analysis of 1080p, 1440p and 4K scalability. You'll note that the 1080p and 1440p results are very, very close, and only 4K is causing any real issues. I mean, basically, my advice for 1080p users is to basically use a card like this for super sampling down from 1440p. Or simply save yourself a big bunch of money and buy an RX 580 or GTX 1060 instead. For 1080p displays, they're both excellent. Oh, but one thing I will say about 1080p performance is that compared to the competition, AMD is competitive with Nvidia's GTX 1070. Now, a gripe that I had with Fury X was simply that it was a good alternative to Nvidia at 4K, but its competitiveness at lower resolutions dropped significantly on many titles. And I'm pleased to say that with Vega, this is no longer the case. So, let's kick off with Rise of the Tomb Raider. 1440p, very high settings. Yeah, this title has long had an NVIDIA advantage, even on DirectX 12, but not anymore. Vega 56 is faster than GTX 1070 with a healthy 9% lead. Another game that has typically favoured the green team has been The Witcher 3, but once again we're seeing that Vega 56 is 7% to the better. Ghost Recon Wildlands, yes, it's in the same camp. It generally loves Nvidia hardware. Here, at the punishing ultra preset, the RX Vega 56 is 6.5% faster. I mean, we're not looking at game-changing improvements here, that's clear, but then we move on to titles where traditionally AMD has taken point and the differential can be seen to widen. Now, to begin with, I'm going to be testing Ashes of the Singularity, of course. It's a game where AMD's lead historically was huge, necessitating some big DX12 driver revision from NVIDIA to bring GeForce cards back into line. At 1440p, though, the AMD lead is back, 9.6%. The same with Hitman, really, another title that historically caused NVIDIA some issues. AMD is a clear 10% ahead. Now, I added Call of Duty Infinite Warfare to the bench test this time around because it's the most optimal iteration of the engine I've seen in years, and I had a hunch that it would favour AMD hardware based on our existing performance analysis tests. I just didn't realise how much of an advantage Vega would deliver. At 1440p, this test is 15.8% faster on Vega 56 versus GTX 1070, and I actually think the CPU ceiling is still in effect here. I mean, the result is basically on par with GTX 1080. If we move that test on to 4K, which effectively rules out the CPU, the Vega's lead over 1070 extends to 20%, though in turn, the GTX 1080 can stretch its legs a bit, posting a 7% lead. But you know what? That's not much, bearing in mind the price differential. The delta between Vega 56 and GTX 1070 actually increases at 4K by a couple of points generally, which begs the question of whether this class of hardware can handle a decent 4K experience. Well, regular Digital Foundry viewers may have been following our occasional 4K on a budget series where we can get some nice results at 4K using nothing more than a GTX 970. I mean, we even ran Crisis 3 at a pretty consistent 30 frames per second at Ultra HD, so it stands to reason that Vega 56 and GTX 1070 can improve on that. 
Now I'd recommend a FreeSync screen here and settings tweaks to keep you above 40 frames per second. It's a bit of an effort, but really it works. Yes, you can game at 4K with this card. All of which leads us on to overclocking and this seemingly innocuous looking scene from Crisis 3. All of that geometry though, all of those alpha effects, for some reason it sends power consumption into overdrive and it's great for power measurements and testing overclocking stability. So I was able to add 11% to the Vega 56's core before things started to go wrong and perhaps not surprisingly, I could ramp up the HBM2 memory to 950 megahertz, matching the full FAT64 model. And we push power up by 50% and let the games begin. So games like Ashes of the Singularity, well at stock speeds, they kind of bench midway between GTX 1070 and GTX 1080, but with an overclock in place, we are just a touch slower than the 1080. The Division, yes, this is a super demanding game, but it likes the Vega hardware and the overclocked 56 can push ahead of the 1080. Just a touch, but there it is, and this is on DX11 too. Are the results? Well, they take a bite out of the GTX 1080's lead, but they don't quite match its overall performance profile. Now, overclocking generally is not something I can really recommend on this reference card though. For Vega 56, the cooler is good enough at stock speeds, but once you start feeding more power into the core, it gets rather too loud for my tastes. With a Sapphire, MSI or ASUS cooler on it though, I don't think that would be too much of an issue. However, power consumption is a problem when overclocking though. At stock, Vega 56 is more power efficient than the last gen Fury X with a lot more performance, but it's clearly way behind Nvidia here and that's a bit of a concern. Overclocking took my system consumption up to 457 watts. And yes, that's why I recommend caution with overclocking on the reference design here. But you know, there are ways to extract extra performance from the Vega 56 without pushing power consumption too much. Let's go back to the Vega processor itself here. Whether you're buying a 56 or a 64, it's basically the same processor with the same HBM2 installed. Now my guess is that the 56's 410 gigabytes per second of bandwidth is artificially limited because you can overclock that alone back to the 484 gigabytes per second that the 64 has with no real effort whatsoever. I mean, you literally dip into AMD's Wattman app, push the memory frequency up to 950 megahertz and move the power slider just a touch to give the system some extra juice. And you will find that this mammoth 18% increase in memory bandwidth really helps. So here's our Witcher 3 benchmark, about 5% of extra performance from the memory OC alone. And that rises to 10.8 when you pile in the power and push the core as far as it will go. I mean, 5% extra for no real effort and no significant hit to power consumption. For me, that is the preferable route forward, especially with this cooler design. Here's another example, Hitman here. Yeah, that insanely loud and hot overclock gets you an extra 11% of performance, but overclocking the memory alone gives you an extra 5%. I mean, if you're looking to extract the most out of the reference card without pushing things right to the limit, the route forward may be simply to overclock the memory, then try smaller increases to the core. Whichever way you slice it, I'm liking the Vega 56 here. In fact, based on my initial tests, I'm liking it much more than the 64, and I'll tell you why. Comparing performance between the stock 56 and the overclock to the limit liquid-cooled 64, I'm only seeing a delta of 10 to 15% in performance terms. Bearing in mind the price differentials, this makes the 56 by far the best buy, and that actually made me wonder. I mean, we can overclock the HBM2 memory to match, so how does that close up the performance difference? Let's return to the Witcher 3 then. Yeah, the 64 is 15% faster than the 56, but that difference drops to 11% with that free memory overclock in place. With Hitman, the liquid called 64 is 16% faster, a lead that drops to 11% just with the HBM2 memory on the 56 adjusted to match. Now consider these numbers against the air-cooled variant of the 64. That gap will close still further as it's not as fast as this liquid-cooled card. Of course, the effects of increased memory bandwidth will vary on a game-by-game -game basis, but there's so much of it left untapped on this 56 model that this is my first port of call when overclocking. So yeah, to my mind, the Vega 56 is the GPU equivalent to the Ryzen 5 1600 in that in terms of price versus performance, it's the clear winner against the competition, but for AMD itself, 
Well, maybe it's just a little too good, bearing in mind that more expensive products in the Vega range demand a lot more money for just a little more performance. Now, in my books, the Vega 56 is a solid buy, but I am a bit concerned that it's taken AMD 14 months to respond to the GTX 1070, and the jury really is out on the Vega 64, where too many of my results so far with this water-cooled beast are on par with GTX 1080, when really, users were quite rightfully expecting more. But that's a story for another time. For now, please do like and subscribe to support our work and follow us on Twitter for the latest DF updates. And if you really want to get behind us, consider our Patreon, which offers up pristine quality downloads of everything we do, plus some lovely bonus goodies every now and again. But for me, for now, thanks for watching.